Welcome, Ron. Ron Reed to Keen on Yoga. Uh, Ron uh, is a well-known uh, Ashtanga practitioner, and he also had a very, very uh, popular and well-known center uh, called Downward Dog in Toronto for many years, which I heard about for many years, but never actually got there. Um, so, welcome, Ron. Nice to nice to talk to you. Nice to have you on. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you haven't got downward dog anymore, have you? So you're relocated more recently to Costa Rica. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, this is sort of a plan that started back in uh, 2013. And we knew somehow we would get here, but we didn't exactly know how. And uh, we were planning to sell anyway, but then COVID came along. And yeah, so we were fortunate. We were able to pass it along to someone who's done a fine job of carrying on this so-called uh, tradition. So, yeah, and then that allowed us to just continue on and, and move down here more full time. I mean, we That's travel a portion of the year anyway. So, you know, and we're looking at the fall to maybe get things back to where it used to be, but. Right, so. yeah. You finally get some um, warmer weather in the winter at least, or at least you avoid <laughs> a hell of a lot of snow. I mean, we were, you know, my, myself and my wife, who's Canadian, we were in Vancouver for a number of years. But, uh -huh. um, I wasn't going to go any colder than that, you know, so we would stay, you know, we were staying on that coast, staying out of that tundra and, you know, uh, snow and ice. And what it did, it did, uh, trees are always laughing at me because it did snow a few days in Vancouver one time. It got pretty cold, like minus 20 or something. You know? and I just didn't go out. I said, I'm not going out until it gets warmer again. <laughs> well, actually, Toronto's nothing compared to where I'm from. So everything is a bonus after. Oh, oh my Winnipeg God. For right, right, right. Yeah. That must just be insane. So, I mean, mind. Oh, it's completely insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It must like be the whole place though. just freezes yeah. for a couple of months. I can't even think. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, it must be a blessing to be in Costa Rica then. I um, mean, and um, I suppose going back to your uh, inverted commas so-called tradition, I suppose that's a great place to start because I always knew you as kind of an Ashtanga practitioner who wasn't so traditional in inverted commas. Um, but having heard you speak more recently, I mean, you you were in the room with with Batabi Joyce. Um, I didn't know that you, you you actually personally trained with him. I don't know what I thought your providency was. Um, so I suppose you know you know the most obvious place to start is to to go back to your days as a as a rock or a musician. I don't know whether you're a rock musician. I know you're a musician. Um, and and then let me know yeah, where rock, you know how, yeah how how that fitted into uh, to to yoga and then Ashtanga yoga. Well, I mean. Interestingly enough, it was it was a drummer in a band that I played in that got me interested in yoga. And it was funny because I never saw him do anything. It was just a word. It was yoga. And quite often when we would go on tour, I would go to the secondhand bookstore and get a few things that I wanted to read. And so one day I walked into a bookstore in Toronto, racks in the front, right in the middle of a rack is an orange book that says the complete illustrated book of yoga <laughs> and i went oh yoga so i took the book with me on the road which was really such a great thing because it's portable Whose you know book i would was get it? to a room i would push everything out of the way uh swami vishnu devananda right so the shivananda limit right, right, right. and uh, shivananda was contemporary with krishnamacharya yeah so yeah. it's sort of like they're about the same sort of period so you and started just practicing on your own. What you did, you didn't enlist the you cover. didn't enlist the drummer's help. You say like you know like come and no <laughs> come and teach me a couple of things. You don't say he's, he's just the drummer. You know, just doing his own thing in the corner like a drummer does. You know, like, you know. Well, he wasn't always on the road with me, so yeah, yeah. All right. Just took the, okay. But you know, I mean, it was it was such a great thing because you know once I started playing more music. I stopped doing much exercise. I tried yeah. running for a while and hated it. And uh, so then once I started doing yoga, it was just it. I started, I never stopped. <laughs> it's just like a that was literally like- You could take anywhere, that isn't, especially if you're on the road. Um, oh, it's so amazing. How long was it before you actually got formal instruction from this? Because the, I kind of always wonder about people that learn it for the book, you know, like, and you could, well, actually, I don't wonder, I've seen it happen. You know, as a teacher, they come in and they say, I've been doing yoga for 10 years from the book. And you think uh, they come into your studio and you think, well, that's great. You've got to practice, but I wish I'd, I wish I'd had you earlier, you know, as it were. <laughs> well, the, the thing was, when I started, it was about 1978. Right. So there wasn't really an earlier. 
and nobody knew what it was like literally so it was i knew this drummer that did yoga i was starting to do yoga and everybody else just went what <laughs> so it's kind of funny so like literally i practiced from about 78 until you know uh maybe 85 and then i met my first teacher who was really oh, wow. a teacher of uh, meditation and yoga philosophy but he was really like uh a wonderful teacher in the sense that he was Indian. He embodied the practice. You know, it certainly wasn't Ashtanga. And when he saw me do my sort of yoga, he was kind of intrigued because to him, it was just something completely different entirely. And then I read about Patabi Joy somewhere around that, that time. All that time on your own. Yeah. It, like every day. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Literally every day. Four o'clock every day, I'm gone. You four a.m. Or oh, four in the evening. Four, no. Yeah, four, four in the four, evening. Right, four p.m. in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it it's it's kind of Canadian evening, right? I know, you, I know, you have dinner early. The evening happens kind of early in Canada. I remember. Yeah. Um, yeah. True enough. Also, because I'm doing gigs at night, I'm not really getting back until two a.m. or whatever. So it was right. get up, eat, take a few hours, practice. <laughs> it all over again right yeah, yeah but yeah. i mean interestingly enough even when i was in mysore because you know there was no messing around in mysore you know one time i went in and lied down on the mat and Patabi joyce goes so you know Mascar, you do and i'm like what so yeah it was do the practice leave the room this is when in the old studio we would sit on the stairs and wait till a, a space opened up. There was 12 spaces. Yeah. Two carpets, one folded over the each other. If you got the spaces on the end, then you had this crumpled up carpet underneath you. How did you get so, there? Yeah. How, did you, how, how did the story um, transpire from your book and, well, and uh, to, to getting to Mysore? Um, well, interestingly enough, uh, my wife at the time was, um, she was studying her master's in she was a ceramist in an art school in the States. And I was teaching yoga there because I'd started to do a bit of it now. And I was working with a, a teacher at this point. And then a woman came to the class and said that she studied with Richard Freeman. And I went, oh, okay, Richard Freeman. Oh, that's Ashtanga. Oh, that's what that guy, Tabby Joyce was, was teaching. So that made me curious. And then I got Richard Freeman's video thinking, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at, at this stuff. Let me see what, what he can do. And then like the demo he does in the beginning of the video, I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, I'm well, doing that at any time, any time soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Wish I hadn't seen that. Yeah. <laughs> so then I, uh, and then I went with a friend to Boulder. Right. So that was my first sort of live okay. taste with it. Mm -mm. And uh, then I got curious and I wanted to go to my source. So I went in 85. I was there 85. basically three times. No, sorry, pardon me, 95. 95, okay. Well, still, 95, I mean, still, still fairly 95. early, but you never, I mean, you were never kind of on the radar as a kind of traditional Ashtanga teacher, and, and right? I mean, you didn't, you, did you get the authorization and all that stuff, or or, or what was your, what was your kind of Yeah, I was, I was yeah. authorized. Right, I was you were. actually you just, one of the, you just didn't keep going back or something. Canadians yeah, yeah. authorized. Right. Well, I went three times. Yeah. By the last time, uh, I opened my studio in 97. The studio is getting quite a bit bigger. I started sort of going through some personal, you know, issues. And it just, it just, I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't take that kind of time and be away. Mm -hmm. I had a son, you know, there was just a lot of things that were sort of like saying, no, you need to be here now. And, uh, but then I would sort of periodically go. And also my first time in, my store. I was there for a few days and this couple moved in next door to me and they happened to be uh, uh, Yoga Works, Chuck and Mati. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, they kind of became my mentors because when I went to the studio and I studied with Chuck, I went, this resonates with me. His, his adjustments were impeccable. They were so clear. Everything made sense to me, you know. If I needed work on something, I could work on it. And then I went to a class of Mati's. It was a level one class, and it was literally the best yoga class I'd ever been to. Yeah. And I just kind of went, wow, these people have something for me. So they started to come to our studio, and they came regularly for a few years. 
when I would go yeah. to LA, then I would venture down and I would study with Tim for a while. I didn't realize you were such, you were such a, a traditional and, you know, kind of like quote unquote, you know, kind of within the current tradition of Ashtanga practitioner. I mean, how was your experience in Mysore then? I mean, you didn't go for personal reasons. Again, I kind of assumed you didn't go for reasons that you didn't, you didn't want to be there or, you know, you were doing something slightly different. Well, I mean, I went first time out of curiosity, but at that time it was a small room and a small group. And, uh, I liked community. Uh, I, I hadn't really felt like I had connected to a community before that sort of like had larger wings and things like that. And I just uh, met a lot of great people. Another teacher I met there, Graham Northfield from mm -hmm. Australia, taught me handstands. That was the other thing at that time is that, you know, like we would go to the, we would go to the shala and we would do our practice, but then everybody gathered at the Southern star afterwards. And I kind of think that that's where the real teaching took place because, you know, Mati was jumping up every two seconds to help somebody or show somebody something. Really? Yeah. And uh, Graham fantastic. was working with me by the pool and he's like, <laughs> up, got me up in a handstand and he's poking me in my ribs. And, you know, so it was, I just, I really enjoyed the community. Yeah. And that was the other reason is because by 1999, which is the last time I went, I kind of felt like my community was gone. You know, right. I caught, I caught the tail end of, to me, which mm, was the original mm -hmm. period where I was meeting people like Chuck and Mati and Graham, uh, Tim Miller. And, you know, I just, I really missed it when, when they weren't going back anymore. So. And mm. then again, like I said, my life started to take another turn and I was just called to stay in Toronto and, and mm. that life mm. for a while. And then when I would travel, I would go LA. Uh, I also went to, Hawaii, um, I spent some time with David Williams, you know, I oh, yeah. kind of wanted to know where things were from the beginning. And yeah. That was a trip. Oh, David yes. was, was oh, he hilarious. Is a... Yeah. He says, they, at one point, he's like, we're, we're doing his practice. And he goes, and yeah, this is what I like to do. And he bang, he opens up his garage door, he gets up in his hands and he starts walking down the driveway on his hands in a handstand. It's hilarious. <laughs> Now he used to say when he first taught it in um, in Hawaii, he was telling me he he was taking everyone, he was walking everyone around the room. Everyone would have yeah. their turn in being held and walked around the room at the end. So yeah. I, had a, I think as I, you know, I've said it many times on the on 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 record. I think that one of the reasons I started these kind of interviews was to show people how it was a lot more kind of open and less rigid and less formulaic, you know, and a little bit of a freer kind of spirited kind of practice as it was, you know taught and, and kind of conveyed in the early days from, from earlier practitioners, let's say. Um, well, I think, you know, part of my understanding of why things kind of got the way that they did is that he was just dealing with so many people. I think it's logistics, wasn't it? Yeah. And a little yeah. room. It was logistics. Yeah. It yeah. was like, get them in, get them out, yeah. no and messing yeah. around, yeah. Yeah. practice, yeah. next person. Yeah. 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 And uh, I think once I started to saw that, see that, it made sense. And also at the time when I was there, he was giving satsang in the afternoon. So he would talk about things and that was kind of cool as well. So there was a, still even that connection, but, and it just, as it got bus busier, yeah, really it was logistics. Yeah. yeah. So you taught the, the same method as in my store in your studio, did you? Cause I know that you, I suppose if I connect the things I know about downward dog, as I say, I didn't go there, but I always kind of wanted to visit you is you had the drumming thing going on, right? You had this, uh, this Ashtanga led primary drum class, which I kind of uh, assumed meant that you were a non-traditional Ashtanga teacher. I'm sorry, I keep going back to that, but I'm just kind of curious as to, as to, as to how you taught and, and what you taught and the differences, I suppose, and the similarities, if you would just talk a little bit about that. Well, I mean, initially I taught sort of in a sense, very traditional. I taught primary series, I taught Mysore, I taught everybody pretty much by the book, but, you know, as I was learning things and I think I probably got to the point where I taught my about 1500th primary series class and I kind of went, I don't think I can do this anymore. Not every time. And at that time I uh, was invited to teach in, in Germany and I just decided I'm going to do something different. And so I kind of started two classes on the same day. One I called yoga jam. And the other called Yoga Lab. And Yoga Jam, I must admit, was the inspiration of Tim Miller because every Thursday he used to do yoga improv. 
Hmm. And that's what I liked about Tim was he was actually sort of, he was traditional, but it was kind of like, you know, he always had a wink in his eye. He always kind of like, he was open to doing things differently, mm. even though he respected the tradition and he taught the tradition. And I took some of my lead from that. And then of course, mm. again, from uh, Chuck and Mati. And, um, yeah. So it was really sort of through the connection. And also, you know, my last time in my I was really determined to learn the uh, arm balances of third series. And because it was getting busier, I was getting less attention and it didn't really work out the way that I'd hoped. Uh, so then I went back to Toronto and we'd invited uh, Danny Paradise to come and teach at our studio. And I was telling him how bummed I was that he, that I didn't learn the arm balances. And he goes, I'll teach him to you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, he'll, no form, he'll show him to you, definitely, for sure. So, yeah. you know, that was also a great connection for me, Danny, because he wasn't connected to that at all. Mm -hmm. So it was just like, yeah, sure, I'll show you. So mm. you did at one point show me the old third and the old fourth. So I didn't continue to practice the old fourth, but I mean, really, um, my series and my series of practice that I was pretty much based around was third. And even when I started to learn fourth, I just treated them as variations to third series poses because I really liked the order and the structure of third. And it the even current, caused the, current, some the, modern, the modern third or the old. Yeah, one. yeah the modern. No, the modern. Well, so the old third that? is really. The the is the really the third that a we do is the now. Third of, yeah, yeah. With about a half of fourth yeah, tacked on. Yeah, I, I yeah. I never really knew what the old the old one was, which is an advanced A, wasn't it, or something like that, an advanced one, there's an advanced two. Yeah, there's an also, ad, but, advanced A and an advanced B, and I think uh, pretty sure it was David Swenson did a video of the old series. Did he? So if you ever wanted I to see, see that? It, right, I, mean, I remember Chuck saying to me. I really liked that one. That was my favorite series, the way it was ordered. And, uh, but, you know, he, he really liked the old one. Um, and I guess he probably just carried on practicing that. Like many people who've been taught at the time, right, they just carried on with the way that been taught at the time. I have seen a little bit of it because I've taught Nancy, some of Nancy's old students, and um, yeah. they, they do that that way. I like the Advanced A series as I learned the modern one. Um, yeah. But obviously it no, starts. It's a, it's, a, it's a great it's, series. Yeah, it's so it starts kind of high end though. It's not a, you know. It's, it's not a, a no, university. You, you university be, yeah, you got to be up there. You got to be. You know, yeah. I'm not sure. I, you know, I was working every, every day these days, but uh, you know, I, at the time, you know, my thirties, uh, I relish that. I love that. Um, so, what would you say is the, the kind of qualities that you know, just to segue slightly, of a of a teacher that you're looking to convey in terms of your the, me the particular methodology that you give as a teacher, you know. I mean, if you're teaching, you know, Ashtanga, but you're not traditional, just trying to get a handle for our listenership, really, on, on what makes you, you know, unique, which I think, you know, from what I've heard, you, you really are. Well, I mean, I really sort of gravitated towards Mysore as a way of teaching. And, you know, even in my own practice, like, you know, I, I'm a musician. And to me, yoga is sort of like body music. And, you know, when I practice yoga, I'm, I'm just, I'm aware, I'm listening out here, I'm listening this way, I'm just really connected to my own body and my own practice. And I started to realize that if I wasn't, then that's when I was getting hurt. If I just tried to, to plow my way through and push through things. So I had this sort of expression that I used to use, you know, to myself, it's just about, you know, letting your body speak to you, right? So I would call it deep listening. And so if I would go somewhere in my practice, like say I'm like, you know, lying down with my leg behind my head, I'm asking myself, does this really feel good for me? Mm. And how could I work with it to make it feel better? So I started to develop sort of what I would call, I sort of call it a language of asana, mm. of how things relate to each other, like across the spectrum. You know, for example, you're doing downward dog. Well, you know, you're also doing a handstand. You're also doing word with anarasana because the work on your arms and your shoulders is really exactly the same. So can I carry the information I've learned from this pose? And can I see those same things in other poses? So I just started to look at it a little bit of a different kind of a way. And I mean, um, also I had my, my own challenges and I really needed to meet those. So just plowing through, I was having some serious knee issues. Right. But Debbie Joyce used to literally step on my knees when I practiced. You're and I thought, you know, that. yeah, 
yeah, I got to sort this out or I can't continue with this. And so that led me on this whole pathway voyage of discovery of working with my inner legs, you know, Winnipeg hockey, not great for uh, Barakanasana. <laughs> yeah. Even Greg, I think Greg Amelie was saying something like, well, he was signifying or chatting to Patavi Joyce that he had these knee issues, you know, and that, you know, that he didn't want any strong adjustments any longer on the Vatican Arsenal or, you know, on, you know, and then they would actually come in harder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think Gavinda Kai said the same thing. He was going to say to Patavi, oh, I've got a problem with my back. I can't really walk very well. And it's like, actually, he was that day he was back bended and, you know, made to catch higher. Than ever before, right? You know, and but I mean, Gavin yeah. Kai has this amazing story where he's somehow cured um, by this this methodology, although it's not um, not to be recommended and probably not um, the general experience. Let's say. Um, I mean, going back to your, what I wanted to say, I suppose, is that the way you're talking is more familiar territory to people nowadays. But I mean, back in the day, and I know you've been talking like this for many years, it's really quite revolutionary to, to make these connections when um, you know, you know, even fifteen, maybe. Yeah, 10, 15 years ago, we were still just talking about, okay, do primary series. Okay, can you get into the asana? Okay, you can make that shape, right? Okay, just plow, as you say, plow, or I would say push or force your way into the next shape and see if you can do that. Okay, you've achieved that, right? You know, and people, you know, we weren't, I don't know whether we were happy or whether we were injury free, but we were, you know, that's the way that we tended to kind of pursue the practice. And, and you've been, I know you've been doing a different thing for many years. I mean, maybe just to, qualify your information. I mean, do you want to just say a couple of things about downward dog then? You mentioned the handstand and the shoulder blades of the downward dog. Can you express that in a little example or vignette of how, how you would teach it? Just just to give a little kind of well, window I guess into it, your teaching. You know, part of it is just sort of perspective, like the position of the ribs. I mean, everybody's working on the line these days, you know, so why drop into your shoulders and let your stomach fall to the floor in downward dog? If you eventually want to be able to learn how to do a handstand with good connected form. And so just sort of seeing right from the beginning that there's an opportunity here for you to learn how to do your handstand now with your first downward dog. Start here. I, and I think that was really helpful for good, me in yeah, terms yeah. of sort of yeah. teaching people is to try and get them earlier on in their practice. Because otherwise, you know, everything that you learn, everything that you do becomes a habit. Yeah. Once it's a habit, we're sort of connected from sort of monomaya kosha to gyanomaya kosha. We move from the mental, logical brain to the intuitive brain. So you want that information that's passing to the intuitive brain to yeah. be good information. Yeah. Yeah. So I that think... when you're not thinking about something, yeah. you're actually doing it well and not hurting yourself. 